Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen, members of the press. Thank you for coming. Um, this is a press conference launching um, the public consultation um, phase of the National Pensions Amendment Bill 2015. Um, I'm Tammy Ebanks. I'm the Acting Deputy Chief Officer in the Ministry of Education, Employment, and Gender Affairs. To my left, of course, is Minister um, for, Responsible for Employment, the Honorable Tara Rivers. And on the end is Director of Department of Labor and Pensions, Mr. Mario Ebanks. I'll be providing you with some information, background information on the legislative process thus far. Minister Rivers will speak specifically to the National Pensions Amendment Bill 2015 and the major changes being proposed. Mr. Ebanks will speak to the public consultation process and how the public can get involved. Unlike the Labor Relations Bill, which is intended to repeal the current Labor Law 2015-2011 revision, the changes being proposed in regards to pensions reform will be encompassed in the current National Pensions Law 2012 revision, and therefore the name will remain the same and the law will not be repealed. The National Pensions Law, which governs the private sector pension regime, came into effect in 1998 and requires all private sector employees to establish a pension plan for all eligible employees. For clarity's sake, the matter of pensions for employees of the Cayman Islands government is covered by under separate legislation and pensions are administered by the Public Service Pensions Board. And the Department of Labor and Pensions through the National Pensions Office Division is a regulatory body responsible for overseeing private pension plans in the Cayman Islands and receive guidance from the government appointed National Pensions Board. With a labor force size of approximately 38,483 persons, the private sector pension regime consists of 16 registered pension plans with a combined number of membership accounts totaling an estimate of 55,000. Of these 16 registered pension plans, six of the plans are multi-employer pension plans that comprise the vast majority of employee and employer members. And it is estimated that the assets under management for the entire pensions regime is approximately US $1.2 billion. In recent years, there have been several amendments made to the National Pensions Law in order to address very specific issues. These include the suspension of pension contributions, known as Pensions Holiday in 2010, and the introduction of the pensions withdrawal mechanism specifically for housing pur purposes, which was done in 2011. The current National Pensions Law 2012 is a consolidation of these amendments which remain in effect. In addition to the various amendments that have been made to the National Pensions Law, the government has also received various reports in regards to evaluating the pensions regime. For instance, in 2007, the then government hired Mercer Human Resource Consulting through a competitive process to review the Cayman Islands National Pensions Law and make recommendations for amendments to the pension system. The scope of the work included actuarial, legislative, and investment analysis. A number of recommendations from this report have been incorporated into the National Pensions Amendment Bill 2015, including the increasing the normal age of pension entitlement, formerly normal retirement age, increasing the le level of fines, allowing access to additional voluntary contributions, and introducing victimization protection. Additionally, in 2010, the Office of the Complaints Commissioner, OCC, issued its own motion investigation report um, entitled Penny, Pension, Pen Penny Pinching Pensions, which the terms of reference were to investigate the ability of the National Pensions Office to effectively investigate, charge, and convict private sector, pension, private sector companies who are non-compliant with pensions contributions as mandated under the law. The report resulted in a series of recommendations, some of which required legislative changes. The recommendations from the OCC report have been incorporated into the National Pensions Amendment Bill 2015, including increased fines, introduction of victimization protection, and changes to facilitate better interagency cooperation. Now that I've provided general information on the pensions regime in the Cayman Islands and the background on the legislation and the reports which supported many of the recommendations that are contained within the bill, I'll turn it over to Minister Rivers who can give more details on the proposed major changes in the bill. Thank you very much, uh, Tammy, and good morning or good afternoon, I should say, to the press and thank you for coming and good afternoon to the listening and viewing public. I want to, um, you know, take this opportunity again just to reiterate that where we are today is as a result of the work that had done had been done previously, but nothing had been actually done to get it to this point in terms of having the, the bill out for public consultation. So the bill was largely informed by the Mercer report of 2007 and then, of course, the Office of the Complaints Commissioner own motions report in 2010. 
So I say that right off the bat to say that, you know, as new minister taking office in 2013, I was very committed to dealing and, and with the issues of pension and some of the, the lingering issues which we as a country were made aware of but um, needed to actually take some action to move it forward in this regard. And so I gave instructions to the team in the ministry and the Department of Labor and Pensions to review the national pensions law and to provide you know, uh, some guidance as to policy considerations that should be put forward in this particular bill for the government's consideration, as well as to advise me as minister, who I would then in turn advise my colleagues in government about additional amendments that may be needed in order to bring the draft bill that we have for currently in front of us in line with our, you know, the government's vision for the pensions regime. And so to that end, the National Pensions Amendment Bill 2015, uh, which I will be referring to as the bill or the amendment bill going forward, contains the first substantial revisions to the National Pensions Law since its enactment in 1998. The overall objectives of the proposed amendments to the National Pensions Law 2012 revision are as follows. To align the National Pensions Law with the reorganization of the labor and pension services in the Cayman Islands by including in legislation the establishment of the Department of Labor and Pensions. To address some of the policy priorities of the government as it relates to pensions reform. To introduce more requirements for pension plans to educate and inform its members. And to introduce new and enhanced mechanisms to improve compliance with the National Pensions Law. I will now take some time to explain the key amendments proposed in the consultation draft of the bill. Section 3 of the amendment bill focuses on definitions and it contains some very significant changes uh, to this section. Specifically, the National Pensions Law established the present normal retirement age for pension, that is the current law, um, which is 60 years of age. So. Firstly, we decided as a government or as a government that we were inclined to increase this age to 65. And then through this p bill, you will see that the terminology actually has been changed from normal retirement age to normal age of pen pension entitlement. As it was recognized that employers were um, incorrectly treating the, the normal retirement age in the pensions law as that as that being an age in which they were entitled to retire people per se, as opposed to being the normal age of pension entitlement. So that uh, particular change is reflected in the National Pensions Amendment Bill to, to signify you know, that important distinction. In 2007, the government at the time engaged, as we said, the Mercer Consulting, uh, Human Resource Consulting, to review the National Pensions Law to make recommendation for changes which included legislative analysis. And this was actually um, recognized as one of the areas in which uh, there should be some change to as well. As well as the, the, the report highlighted the effect, you know, of normal age of pension entitlement on the income replacement ratio at retirement. So in the report, it discusses the, the replacement ratio of 60 to 70 percent of pre-retirement income is compared adequate in most developing countries. However, it's also important to note that the actual replacement ratio is also likely to vary greatly by, you know, from individual to individual. A replacement ratio of less than 100 percent of pre-retirement income is considered adequate in most countries because of the anticipated reduction in pre-retirement spending, such as the elimination of mortgage payments, costs associated with dependent children would decrease with time, employment-related costs, and in, in relevant countries, the issue as it relates to um, income taxes payable. So as a result of this, the amendment bill is also proposing to increase the normal age of pension entitlement from 60 to 65. This as well as it aligns with the vision of the government, aligns with the recommendations of the 2007 Mercer report, as by increasing the normal age of pension entitlement from 60 to 65, we expect to improve the income replacement ratio that I just discussed at retirement for all employees, given that they are longer in the workforce and able to accrue uh, additional income as a result, or pension, I would say. 
This increase also recognizes the longevity of people in today's society, as I said, and is more in line with international standards. For example, many countries currently are increasing their retirement uh, and pensionable age from work. With respect to the United Kingdom, the pension entitlement age is now 65 and it's being proposed to increase to 67 in the 2026 to 2028, somewhere in that range. So that's a discussion that's currently on the way or was on the way most recently. In Singapore, the retirement age is 62. In the U.S., the pensions eligibility may begin at 62, with 67 years old being considered the full normal retirement age. And in Canada, access to the old age security and guaranteed income supplement is at age 65. And they are also proposing to increase this to age 67 in 2029. So this move to increase the pension entitlement age is in line with what's happening in um, many parts of the world. Also consistent with the 2007 Mercer Report, the amendment bill proposes the year's maximum pensionable earnings, YMPE for short, to be increased from the current amount of 60,000 CI to CI 87,000, which is the inflation adjusted figure reflecting the 2007 recommended figure of 72,000. So the figure recommended in, 2000, in 2007 was an increase from 60,000, which is the current year's maximum pensionable earning, um, to 72,000. But having considered that 2007 is a number of years ago, the um, Economics and Statistics Office was approached to give us an adjusted, adjusted inflation adjusted figure to represent um, real value today. And so the recommendation is to increase it from 60,000 to 87,000, which is in line with what the report called for in 2007. The year's maximum pensionable earning determines the amount above which an employee and employer are no longer statutorily required to pay pension contributions. So that's what that YMPE stands for. However, there is nothing in the national pensions law and nothing proposed in the amendment bill to prohibit the payment of contributions of earnings above this amount. In regards to the rationale behind increasing the year's maximum pensionable earnings figure, one of the issues considered in the Mercer report was benefit adequacy. And so this is measured by comparing the retirement pension to the pre-retirement income of an individual. A replacement rate of 60 to 70% of pre-retirement income is considered adequate in most developing countries. However, it's important to note that the actual ratio is likely to vary greatly again by the individuals, as I said. And with the increase in the year's maximum pensionable earnings as recommended by the Mercer Report, the replacement ratio for members will increase from a range of 24% to 50% to a new range of 39% to 53%. So just looking solely at the increase in the year's maximum pensionable earnings, we see the increase in this replacement ratio. However, this increase in year, um, the year's maximum pensionable earnings coupled with the increase in the retirement age to 65, or the age of pension entitlement, I should say, to age 65, and the removal of impediments to access additional voluntary contributions are estimated by Mercer to increase the replacement ratios to 57 to 78%, which is well within or in some cases above the, the uh, recommended replacement ratio of 60 to 70%. There was also been a change in policy with respect to the individuals required to pay pensions contributions. So in this particular bill, you will see under section three of the amendment bill, the proposal to amend the definition of employee to exclude persons consi consistently working less than 15 hours per week. Um, as a result, these persons will no longer be pensionable and therefore neither the individual nor employer will be required to pay pension contributions. This change in definition is a new proposal contained in the bill, as I said, but there are also proposed amendments to the definition of, em of employee in the draft labor relations bill, which we spoke about um, last week, that was released for public consultation, as I said. And so for the avoidance of doubt, this proposed change has not yet come into effect. This is just a proposal in this particular bill. And so the current regime, which is in place, is still expected to be adhered to um, you know, until such time as the amendment bill 
is passed in the in the Legislative Assembly and comes into force. In an effort to address the issue of lack of compliance with the National Pensions Law and um, by some employers, starting in Section 4, which de de deals with the establishment of pension plans, and throughout the amendment bill, you will see that the fines have been significantly increased and new fines have been proposed, recognizing that such fines for failure to adhere to the National Pensions Law have not been amended since the inception of the law in 1998. So this also brings the recommended changes in the bill in line with the recommendations of the 2010 own motion investigation report that, I, that we spoke about previously, which was conducted by the Office of the Complaints Commissioner entitled Penny Pinching Pensions. Also in Section 4 of the Amendment Bill, the Director will now be required to publish a notice of each pension plan registered under the National Pensions Law including a list of the key parties, such as the administrator and investment manager for each pension plan. Again, this will be, ensure that the public continues to be aware of the registered pension plans operating in the Cayman Islands, as well as the various agents and representatives which the pension plan administrators have retained. This will empower employees and allow them to access the information as well as clarify, or, you know, as well as provide clarity on the operation and performance of their pension plans. With respect to the duties of pension plan administrators contained in Section 16 of the National Pensions Law, we have revised the content to reflect requirements previously contained elsewhere in the National Pensions Law and regulations. So the administrator's duties have also been expanded to include the following, a mandatory annual gen general meetings for members, a provision of investment returns and expense ratios it reports to the pension plan, submission of evidence of the ongoing administrator training, the filing of audited financial statements in three months after the fiscal year end instead of the current requirement of six months, and the filing of monthly employer movement reports in or, in or out of the pension plan. In addition, when the pension plan is submitted for registration, the administrator will also be required to file a statement of investment policy. And this is connected to the upcoming amendments being proposed in the National Pensions Pension Fund Investment Regulations, which are currently being reviewed and drafted. In the amendment bill, there is a proposed requirement for all employers to establish and maintain detailed records for all pensionable employees. Again, given the enforcement challenges faced by the Department of Labor and Pension, the provision is especially important as we build and we strive to create a culture of compliance and increase the number of inspections by employers, of, of employers, while at the same time create greater opportunities for employees to obtain information. The requirement to establish and maintain such records is also coupled with the penalty for non-compliance. Examples of records that will be required include, but are not limited to, employees' names, employee dates, uh, gross and net amounts of pay, all pension deduct deductions from employees' pay, and all pension contribution paid into pension plans. Section 20, which deals with information from administrator, and Section 22, the annual statement of pension benefits of the amendment bill have been amended in line with the objective for pension plan administrators to educate and inform members by providing them with additional and meaningful information, including details of the investment returns and expense ratios of the pension plans. Again, it's to increase the information sharing uh, to the members with respect to what is happening in their pension plan. So additionally, again, the bill proposes to increase the frequency of member statements from annually to quarterly. But it is important to note that the bill expressly authorizes statements to be issued to members electronically with the member's written consent. So recognizing that we are in the age of electronics and so that ability is um, specifically allowed for in the bill. Um, however, the member must consent to this and if such consent is not received, then the pension plan will continue to be required to provide the paper statements or hard copies. Section 23, entitled Inspection of Administrator's Documents, has also been changed. With this provision, the frequency of access to pension plan documents has been increased from one year to every six months. 
However, the access is limited to persons listed in the National Pensions Law, which includes members, former members, employers, and other individuals specified. In the amendment bill, Section 25, which details the eligibility for membership in a pension plan, is also proposed to be amended. In order to improve pension equity and consistency for all eligible employees, irrespective of nationality or immigration status, all Caymanians and non-Caymanians would not be required to be pensionable for the initial six months of their employment, which would encompass all categories of eligible employees, again, or pensionable employees. With the introduction of this amendment, the government um, proposes to eliminate the current requirement of different commencement period for employees solely based on their immigration status. So, for example, currently, under the current National Pensions Law, all Caymanian and permanent residents are pensionable immediately, while work permit holders are pensionable after nine months of continuous employment in the islands. The proposed amendment aims to level the playing field, in other words, as it relates to the cost associated with hiring a Caymanian or permanent resident as compared to a work permit holder, um, as it relates to the payment of pensions, of course as the current regime currently acts as a financial incentive in some ways to hire work permit holders due to the delay in the requirement to have to make pensions for such employees if people are competing solely on um, the ability to pay pensions or otherwise. So this amendment is also in line with the normal maximum initial probation period of six months under the current labor law, which um, is important to highlight that that, you know, maximum initial probation period of six months. Um, there's no proposed changes to that provision um, under the Labor Relations Bill 2015. That provision is um, pretty much staying as is. But the six months um, initial period prior to one uh, an employee becoming pensionable is in line with that kind of probationary period, which is outlined in the labor law, and is also in response to the industry request to accommodate non-renewing seasonal workers on work permits. In the area of overseas transfers as sanctioned by the Department of Labor and Pensions, under Section 34, the bill expands the criteria that must be met before overseas transfers can be executed, which also um, intends to close a loophole, a loophole which dates back to the original 1998 National Pensions Law that currently permits transfers or refunds for persons who are off islands for as short as six month period. Um, so again, the new criteria proposed in the amendment bill will be as follows. The member's employment must be terminated. There must be no contributions to their pension account for three years. And the member must be absent from the islands for three years in order to access the um, ability to transfer pensions outside of the pension plan outside of the jurisdiction, that is. As, as we seek to minimize the possibility of persons accessing their pension benefits and then subsequently becoming wards of the state in later life, should they return to the jurisdiction, we believe that you know a more rigid criterion for overseas transfers is necessary. And again, for clarity, please note that this is for overseas transfers um, and these, you know, have detailed requirements which are not applicable to transfers between registered plans on island. So this regime specifically deals with the ability to transfer your pensions outside the jurisdiction. Also in section 34, we've added a subsection to permit transfers from registered pension plans under the National Pension Law to pension plans and administered under the Public Service Pension Board, which does not currently exist in the National Pensions Law. So this new subsection now formally addresses the issue of portability between private and public sector pension plans, which again has been a long-standing issue for a number of members that may move between the private sector and the public sector. And for clarity, uh, there is already a provision in the Public Service Pensions Law which um, permits transfers of pension to pension plans registered under the National Pensions Law. So it does create this reciprocal relationship now as it relates to transfer of pensions. We also recognize the desire to encourage members to save for retirement above and beyond what's required um, to be contributed 
pursuant to the required 10% contribution rate, which currently exists. So to that end, the bill actually um, adds a section or a subsection that allows members to access their additional voluntary contributions prior to retirement. And again, um, it is acknowledged that while the national pension law has allowed for the accumulation of the additional voluntary contributions, it has not enabled access to those contributions until retirement. So that is what the current um, pension regime uh, entails. But uh, in line with the 2007 Mercer report and the recommendations coming from that report and subject you know, to the pension plan um, particular requirements, this amendment allows members to access, or they would allow members to access the additional voluntary contributions if they are needed prior to reaching the normal age of pension entitlement. However, by allowing those contributions to be accessible if needed, we, you know, again, the aspiration is to encourage members to build these additional savings in their pension plans as a result of this because some people are a bit hesitant to put additional voluntary contributions into pensions because of the, the lock-in that currently exists with respect to not being able to access those additional voluntary contributions until retirement. And so um, we are encouraging people to contribute more than, than they need by facilitating this type of access if and when they were to you know, need to access it prior to. And again, this is, this is dealing with the additional voluntary contributions, anything that's paid in above and beyond the 10% uh, maximum. So upon receiving the additional voluntary contributions, the pension plan administrator would need to code these you know, contributions separately according to, you know, to how their system is set up and that um, it would be just the additional voluntary contributions that would be accessible and not the kind of mandatory required contributions, which is earmarked for retirement purposes only. We also remain cognizant of the need to continue to address issues of non-compliance and to build, as I said, a culture of compliance going forward. Accordingly, Section 48 of the National Pensions Law has been amended to facilitate the enforcement of employer pension contribution delinquency through a variety of enforcement tools. As such, the bill introduces fixed timelines and deadlines with respect to determining delinquency and reporting and the processing of delinquency reports. Most important, the pension plan administrator will be required to notify the affected employees of their employer's non-compliance and may also publish this information. In the amendment bill, Section 53 has been amended to remove the ability to obtain refunds regardless of immigration status. Again, there will remain, however, two very specific circumstances in this current bill as proposed. Um, the ability to access refunds will, re will remain permissible in um, the administrator's discretion where the commuted value is less than 5,000 CI or where a, num a member reaches the age of normal pension entitlement, i.e. the proposed 65 years, and wants to but is unable to transfer their pension benefit to an approved overseas pension plan or retirement savings account, etc. The bill allows then for Cabinet to issue an order to determine when this provision would, would come into effect as well. One of the objectives that um, was mentioned previously at the beginning of my remarks relates to the alignment of the national pensions law with the reorganization of the labor and pension services in the Cayman Islands, which is carried out by the Department of Labor and Pensions. To that end, the amendment bill has established in law the Department of Labor and Pensions under the national pensions law, which will replace the reference to the national pensions office as the private sector pension regulator and the title of superintendent will be removed and replaced by director again uh, bringing the law in line with what actually happens now in reality however the decisions or actions previously taken under the national pensions office and the superintendent of pensions will be recognized and honored so this is a you know um, this would be reflecting changes going forward to how the the regime is administered in Section 90, which deals with offenses the amendment of, of the amendment bill, um, the provisions have been altered to um, the calculation of time frames after which summer pr proceedings cannot be pursued. So the revised wording in the bill shows a changed 
uh, change to the commencement of this time frame calculation to when the matter is reported to the director and also expands the period from five years to seven years, which is also consistent with the period that records must be maintained by employers. In addition to the changes made to Section 48, which deals with delinquency, the bill adds a subsequent enforcement tool with the inclusion of a fixed penalty offenses regime, which is intended to provide a mechanism for a more efficient resolution of pension violations. Again, this process allows the enforcement of the National Pensions Law without necessarily pursuing court action. However, you know, the court system always or will remain as a viable option for the employer should they choose to go that route. The amendment bill also introduces an anti-victimization clause, again as recommended by the Office of the Complaints Commissioner in its own motions report. Section 94A of the amendment bill introduces a non-victimization clause which is intended to protect those employees which who disclosed to their uh, or who disclosed to the department their employer's non-compliance from possible victimization by that employer and again the term victimization includes the following um, concepts are dismissal suspension denial of promotion demotion redundancy intimidation subjection to any discrimination by an employer an, an employee or employer or the threat of any of the actions that I've just listed so again, if victimization is believed to have occurred, the employee can file a complaint with the Department of Labor and Pension um, under, pursuant to the, the proposed amendments in this bill. In an effort to facilitate greater interministerial cooperation, which has also um, been recommended in the Office of the Complaint Commissioner's report, and which the government, which this particular government recognizes as key to building the culture of compliance in the country, language has been added to the bill that specifically permits the sharing of information with government departments and statutory authorities in relation to the compliance of pension plans and the failure of employers to provide pension benefits or make timely contributions in accordance with the National Pensions Law. And you would have um, be familiar with the fact that this is this information sharing is critical uh, to the approach of enhancing pensions and other um, statutory obligation requirements of employers and, and, and there will be a regime that actually ties this with the trade and business licensing um, process as well as other um, mechanisms. So this is de definitely um, uh, an important tool which the government recognizes needs to be put in place in order to address the long-standing issues of compliance. So it actually puts a positive obligation uh, on many, in many instances on the employers to remain and to stay compliant with the pension laws, uh, um, insurance, health insurance laws, etc. So in addition, the bill um, has introduced the process to allow for employers to apply to the Director of Labor and Pensions for a verification of compliance letter that enables employers to request and again obtain verification of their compliance with the National Pensions Law. And this verification letter which is you know, akin to a letter of good standing under the company registries regime, will become increasingly important as we as a country continue to improve the interministerial cooperation and build, as I said, the culture of co compliance, which employers will be required to prove their adherence to the national pension law um, with respect to applications for work permits, applications for trade and business licenses, etc. So um, in conclusion, the pension system in the Cayman Islands is of critical importance to the country's prosperous future. Currently, the assets under management, um, being that of close to, if not exceeding, US $1.2 billion, this is in fact a national treasure, which may only be the only means of retirement security for some of our citizens. We must therefore effectively regulate this national asset and the proposed Pension Amendment Bill 2015 attempts to address some of the concerns in that regard. As you can see, um, the Ministry of Employment and the Department of Labor and Pensions have been extremely busy over the past year with work related to the establishment of a national minimum wage regime for the Cayman Islands, again, the first ever comprehensive approach to determining suitable minimum wage regime 
in the Cayman Islands given current socioeconomic conditions that exist with work related to the development of the consultation draft of the Labor Relations Bill 2015, which we just launched for public consultation last week. And of course, now with the work related to the draft National Pensions Amendment Bill 2015. All of this work, and in particular, the two pieces of proposed legislation represents the first real attempt at a comprehensive review of the labor law in over a decade and the pensions law um, since inception 15 years ago. So certainly, as minister responsible with these particular laws in this area and as the government as a whole, we are committed to tackling the real issues that exist and improving the lives of our people as it relates to labor relations on the job and as it relates to requirement security once people reach that point in their lives. We want people to be able to retire with and live out their life with dignity and relative self-reliance. So this is the impetus behind some of the amendments that are put forward with respect to the national pensions law in this case. Again, I would like to thank the government, my, my government colleagues, for their support that I have received to date um, on moving ahead with this very important legislative reform. And I'd also like to thank the Acting Chief Officer, Mr. Kristen Siku of the Ministry of Education, Employment and Gender, Gender Affairs, the Acting Deputy Chief Officer, Ms. Tammy Ebanks, and the staff of the Ministry of Education, Employment and Gender Affairs, Ms. Amy Williston, who acts as um, the policy advisor in this regard to the area of pensions, and also um, the director, Mr. Mario Ebanks, and the staff of the Department of Labor and Pensions, and of course, the legal drafting department, for their very hard work on this assignment to date. Um, as you said, we have been issuing a series of bills within the last month, and it just shows the reflection, a reflection of the work that has been taking place behind the scenes to get us to this point, and I hope that it also signals to the country that when it comes to the issues as it relates to improving labor relations, pension regime in the country, the government and myself, obviously, as minister responsible, we're serious and committed about doing what we can to address these concerns. However, um, it is a public consultation draft, so we do look forward to getting the feedback from the relevant stakeholders and similar to what is planned for the uh, Labor Relations Bill, which the, acting, which the director will talk to us a bit more about, um, we do hope to get the feedback from the relevant stakeholders, of course, employers and employees being key to that process. And so I will ask Mr. Ebanks to take us through the process of public consultation on the bill. However, before I ask him to, to launch into the details of that particular exercise, I would like to ask him to discuss the efforts taken by the Department of Labor and Pensions uh, up until this point with respect to enhancing the pensions regulation enforcement. So the department hasn't necessarily waited to actually have this bill um, out in the public or, or, or being passed before they have actually taken action to address the concerns which we know have been existed for some time. So I'd like the director to give us an opportunity to hear what some of those efforts have been, um, most notably over the last two years. Thank you very much, Minister Rivers. Good afternoon to the media representatives here of today and the public who are listening and watching on the radio and television. As the Minister mentioned, before I outline the proposed consultation process in more detail, I want to assure the public that the Ministry and the Department of Labor and Pensions have not been relying solely on amendments to the law to be passed, as the Minister said, uh, and to come into force in order to continue the work that we need to do to achieve our mission. On the contrary, a host of initiatives and innovations have been pursued and are constantly being fine-tuned by the department staff and the ministry and the entire team. Some of these are strengthening of relations between the Department of Labor and Pensions, the Department of Commerce and Investment, DCI, the Health Insurance Commission, and the, the Immigration Department by sharing information and intelligence on non-compliance by our various clients. Two, the Department of Labor and Pensions and the Department of Commerce and Investment have instituted an initial due diligence regime for a letter of good standing to verify compliance with pensions. And this will be significantly expanded over the next, over the, when the new trade business licensing law comes into force this summer, 
very soon, and which will mandate that all trade business license uh, holders must, must be pensions compliant in order to get a trade and business license renewed. Three, the National Pension Board and the Department are working with the Certified Financial Analysts CFA Society to develop a protocol for what we are calling a standardized investment performance reporting regime by pension plans so that employees can understand and better compare the performance of Cayman's registered pension plans. Four, the National Pensions Board and the Department are also examining the current drawdown schedule for retirement pensions, uh, which now, as many of you know, now award a fixed amount of 12,000 CI dollars per annum to retirees, regardless of the value of the employee's pension account. Excuse me. During the past two years, the Department of Labor and Pensions and its National Pensions Office have identif intensified our efforts at supervising pension plans and their administrators. And these activities have included on-site and desk-based governance inspections and reviews of those pension plans, financial statements analysis, and also actuarial valuation submissions by all pension plan administrators. That's required by law, and we also insist that it be carried out. The seven, or sixth point is that the department has intensified training and awareness of all stakeholders via the media, courses and training opportunities, the circulation of research papers, as well as awareness seminars conducted for trustees of pension plans and other pension stakeholders, most recently through the same CFA Society with whom we are very appreciative and we are working very closely. Uh, next, in regard to enforcement, in addition to the proposed higher fines and the administrative fines regime, in this amendment bill, the department is also seeking to improve its relationship and effectiveness with the Department of Public Prosecutions through enhanced protocols and efficiency. Finally, uh, the ministry and the department are seeking to ensure that the department's pension staff are developed and trained in the latest systems that are reasonably accessible to us. And again, we are working with the CFA Society, the Civil Service College, and other providers in terms of upskilling the staff and team members of the department. And so, given the substantive amendments that have been made in this bill, as Minister Rivers have, has just outlined, and the critical nature of this piece of legislation, the Ministry of Education, Employment, and Gender Affairs, and the Department of Labor and Pensions, will be launching a 60-day public consultation exercise on this draft bill. The National Pensions Amendment Bill 2015 will be released as a discussion document in order to allow the public and key stakeholders to become familiar with and comment on the proposed legislation changes. Later this week, the bill will be available on the Ministry Education website, which I hope you all know now by heart, www.education.gov.ky. And for direct access to the web page containing the, the draft of the bill, the public should go to www.education.gov.ky backslash labor pensions. One word, labor is spelled the English version for those of the American leaning. Once reviewed, the public can also send their comments and or concerns to the ministry. A special email address has been established for this purpose, and the email address is lpl at gov, G -O -V, dot ky. And important to know that these submissions must also be received by 31st of August, 2015. In order to assist the public in navigating the detailed piece of proposed legislation, there's also a summary document available 
on the webpage, which will outline the main changes proposed in the Pension Amendment Bill. Other plans for public consultation, as in the case of, of the Labor Relations Bill, include key stakeholders' meetings and public meetings in all the districts. The details for the public meetings will be released to the public in the coming week via the various media outlets and will also be posted on the web page containing the bill. The public meetings on the National Pensions Amendment Bill 2015 will take place in all districts in Grand Cayman and in Cayman Brac and will occur in the month of August. As was stated by us in last week's press conference on the Labor Relations Bill, the public consultation phase of the National Pensions Amendment Bill 2015 will be conducted in tandem with the public consultation phase to discuss the proposed changes within the Labor Relations Bill 2015. And so as a reminder to you, our friends in the media, and to the public, given that these two bills will complement one another and have similar stakeholders, there may be some overlapping stakeholder meetings. However, there will be separate public meetings on the two bills, which will be attended by the minister and other uh, advisors. With the public meetings for the Labor Relations Bill starting in July, and as already stated, the public meetings concerning the Pensions Amendment Bill will commence in August. Additionally, we plan to have very, very simple opinion surveys available on these bills, uh, hopefully available to the public next month. And so on behalf of the Ministry and the Department, I'd like to encourage all members of the public to read the National Pensions Amendment Bill 2015 and to take part, active part, in the public consultation process in some way, whether it is by attending district meetings, sending an email, or completing a survey, as these proposed changes will affect every single private sector employer and every eligible employee in the Cayman Islands. And now turn you back to Acting Deputy Chief Officer, Ms. Tommy Ebanks. Thank you, Mr. Ebanks and Minister Rivers for providing the information. Um, thank you to the members of the media for attending and for the public for listening. And we'll open the floor now if you have any questions. I have a few questions. Um, Carsley Fuller, Radio Cayman. Did you say that the letter of good standing was going to be mandatory to get your trade and business license renewal? Yes, ma'am, I did. Okay. I the the to letter of good standing is in place now and is basically in place for the incentive program that the um, Department of Commerce and Investment has for micro business and small business. But it's going to become mandatory for all business license renewals when the trade business license law comes into effect sometime in the summer. But people can request that for themselves if they want it voluntarily aside from that. Yeah, it has to be provided for by the department as an official letter, and there is likely to be also a fee for it, but they will, ha they will have to present that to the Department of Commerce in order to get their trade and business license renewed. Cool. And do, does this legislation um, cover domestics working for individuals? At, at the present time, um, domestics are not are not uh, covered under the, the pension legislation. Okay. And do you guys have any plans in place to update the legislation that's related to the public pensions plan? You know, maybe with regards to the overseas transfers or the voluntary additional contributions. Any plans for that? Well, that obviously is um, governed by a separate right. legislative regime, which doesn't fall under the Ministry mm -hmm. of Employment. So, I mean, it's obviously a, a, a conversation that would need to be had with the relevant ministry uh, in that regard. I mean, as it stands right now, I know they are looking at making some um, specific changes to that regime as well. To the extent of what that is, I'm, I'm not I'm not 100 percent sure. Okay, So it's not like in the works to get like two different to mirror the two legislation. Well, in, in some instances, yes. And in some of the provisions, I know the provision as it relates to the raising of the retirement age is certainly one something that is being considered from the public service um, pension regime perspective. But other particular um, recommended changes, I'm, I'm not I'm not uh, aware of in terms of the details of it at this stage because it hasn't come before cabinet for discussion. Cool. In that no regard. Thank you very much. Um, 
the um, Minister Rivers, can you explain to me how this is going to work where it, it, if a person reaches age 62 and decides they don't want to stop in the private sector and decides they want to stop working, they don't get their pension. They, they don't get their pension until age 65. That's how that's basically how this is going to work. Um, I'll actually ask the director to give okay. a bit more specific specificity on on how the actual regime would work with respect to the eligibility of full pensions versus um, partial pensions or otherwise. Yes, we do have a, a sliding scale at the moment in terms of, of retirement. You can get early retirement at age 60 and then full at, at, at age 50, sorry, and full at age 60. But the new age um, range is also going to be a, a, a sliding scale. And um, that's outlined in the in the bill. Um, but but obviously, like I say, our, 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 the point we want to make in the labor relations bill and in this pension bill is that nobody's going to be prevented from retiring early if they want to. Um, but um, there will be obviously um, an arrangement to be to be undertaken in regard to access to pension. Well, I don't, I don't I don't, haven't seen the bill. I don't even know if it's been gazetted yet. Is it? Is it? No, in, no, it hasn't been gazetted yet okay. because it is a public consultation draft, and that okay. was the, the particular reason that we haven't gone to the point of gazetting it for you know delivered to the house because we want to still engage the public to uh, make sure that we have um, you know as comprehensive a bill as we we need to have considering the the concerns that may be expressed coming from the public in this regard too. Well, but Mr. E, Mr. Ebanks, do you know what's the earliest age you can receive a pension under the new legislation? Is it still 50, or is it is it up to 55? No, now? it'll be it'll be up to it'll be a, a higher um, age. I will, I will defer to the um, the individual who acted acted as the resource person for the drafting on this. Good afternoon. <clears throat> Excuse me. Good afternoon. Under the um, pensions law as it currently stands, early retirement is defined as 10 years prior to normal retirement. So in the amendment bill, we haven't made any changes to that provision. As we're changing the age from 60 to 65, the early retirement would change from 50 to 55. Okay. Um, couple of other things. On the, the maximum pensionable earnings going from 60 to 60,000 a year to 78,000. 87. Uh, 87,000, yeah, thanks. Um, is that a... Are are you all concerned that that might be a, a viewed as a as a fee increase or a tax increase by government? And if so, why why not? Why or why not? Well, no, it's not because it's not a fee per se or a tax. What it is is in, it ensures that there is there is um, better ability for persons when they retire to be able to um, sustain themselves. So it it ties to the discussion that I had about the income replacement ratio and what is considered um, recommended or adequate uh, being, you know, as I said, the range being 60 to 70 percent is what is considered by the, the experts, the technical experts in this area, um, as being a, re a income replacement ratio to be um, the, the, the goal to ensure that persons can still meet their obligations upon retirement. So in that regard, that's the, the, that's the purpose for why we felt it was necessary to um, to take on board the recommendations that had been made back in 2007 when the report was initially done um, by Mercer Consulting. As I said, the 87 is the kind of inflation adjusted figure of what was recommended in, a, in, in 2007 to be an increase to 72,000 at that time. Could I just add to that, uh, Brent, please? Um, under the current regime, 10% uh, of 60,000 a year, 6,000. So if you if you take that to say 40 years of working, I think you end up in about you know the numbers better, but I think 240 thousand dollars or thereabouts is what you get after 40 years. Now obviously with the future value of money and inflation, that's not going to do very much for for anybody, uh, even in today's um, uh, value. Um, it's also important to 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 know that in Bermuda, the uh, maximum pensionable earnings per annum is 200,000 US dollars per annum. So ours is now 60. Bermuda at one point was unlimited. There was no ceiling, but they brought it down to $200,000. So whereas, as the minister mentioned, uh, or you mentioned, Brett, that they may be regarded as a increase in cost, the other side of the coin is that if you look at what is the cost of those individuals who are not able to survive after retirement and become wards of the state, and which will attract potential um, 
uh, taxes to sustain, that's also going to be a cost. But on the flip side as well, the, 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 this bill uh, in relation to cost, this bill uh, decreases the cost in that Caymanians uh, don't have to be um, enrolled until six months after employment as well as, as non-Caymanians. So you have, you have some give and take there as well. And also the, the, the proposal that anyone working less than 15 hours a week would also be not considered pensionable um, under this particular proposal, which is not the case currently. Um, so as, as the director said, there is some, some looking at the, the, the balance of striking, you know, um, so in this instance, raising the retirement, or sorry, raising the, the year maximum pensionable earnings may seem as an additional um, payment requirement, but there are other areas where those same employees would be able to pay less given um, any employees that fall within those particular categories. Okay. And just one more, and now my colleagues must be getting impatient with me. Uh, the, the the issue with when someone who goes off island can uh, transfer or collect their pension savings, uh, I think it was mentioned that it's the time frame is increased to three years. Um, and there were se several things the minister stated. I'm just going back from, from memory that one, they, they have to stop working for the company. Does that mean the person can, has to pay pensions if they're off the island and still working for a company? Also, the, the time frame now, I think, is two years within which you have to stop investing in the plan. If, if I'm wrong about that, Mr. Mario, please let me know. But what I don't get, what's the, I don't understand what is the benefit of waiting from two years to three years from when those people can get their money transferred, especially if they're required to leave. If, if someone could kind of explain that for me, if you get what I'm asking. I'll start on that, and I'm sure the minister will add. There's a whole lot of answers in that question of yours, Brent. But, you know, um, right now it is, the, the rules are in the, in, the, in the law, I think it's Section 53 of the current National Pensions Law, that um, you have to be inactive or not, not, in, not uh, contributing to a pension for two years and then be not legally resident for six months. Now, if somebody gets rolled over and, and they go off um, for, for a year and they return to the island, those persons could have been got the refund of their money and then come back to the island and perhaps stay here for another 15, 20 years and become Caymanians and would have lost some of that, that retirement income. So the, the purpose of this is to, as the minister mentioned, to try to, to increase the income replacement ratio to, prov to close the loopholes and to bring about equity to all, all people. I know people who simply go away for six months for the purpose of, of applying and getting their refund. As soon as they get that, the next day they're, they're on a plane and they're back here working again. And this happened. And this is a bold effort to close that obvious loophole. Yeah, just two questions. Um, the first one is, is there any consideration for increasing the 10% contribution at this time? Um, as we know, as you've said, um, it would not be enough based on w our calculations. And we've heard that cry from many people. Um, it, it is not proposed in this current bill. Again, um, given the considerations, the balance that needs to happen with respect to, um, you know, this is what we put forward is, is a significant improvement on what we have now. Um, and, and, and learning that it's necessary to sometimes crawl before you walk, even though I think we're, we're walking before we run um, in this case. I think we, we certainly, we, we considered it, but given, given all the factors, given the concern about increasing cost of business as well, um, given the fact that the increase in the age of pension, you know, entitlement coupled with the year uh, maximum earnings brought the income replacement ratio projection for Cayman to be within and, and depending on the individuals exceeding the, the acceptable rate. So we thought at this time, at this stage, this was what was, um, was what we were proposing as to be the amendment to this particular regime. It is something that I think that we would may need to consider, you know, down the line, but for right now, given all of the other recommended changes, it is not something that's being proposed in the current bill. Okay. One final question, and maybe I missed it earlier, but it's regarding to regulating how these funds are invested. Um, it's $1.2 billion, and there have been cries, as we call it, from the public as to how their funds are invested um, to, get the, to maximize the returns on it. 
um, there's been some consideration of investing locally to try and help the local economy. Um, does the regulations or does the bill um, speak to the regulations of the investments? Well, the work on the investment regulations is, is, is happening now as we speak. So we're not in a position to actually speak to what the proposed changes would, would be in that regard as yet. Um, but we are, again, in tandem with making these changes to the proposed bill and getting these out for public consultation. We are working, uh, the ministry is working and with the department and other stakeholders to, to determine um, an appropriate kind of investment regime to deal with some of the issues that you've outlined. So we hope to be able to bring that forward um, to the public shortly as well. Thank you. If I could just add to that question, Ralph. Um, as I said in my statement, um, one of the things that we're doing also is working with the CFA Society and mm -hmm. putting together the, mm -hmm. um, the in, in standardized mm -hmm. investment uh, reporting uh, protocol, which will help to cl uh, clear up all of this situation as to people's return and make sure that it's clear. Um, and so, also in the in the law, in the in the um, in the regulations, there's a requirement that auditors must report to the superintendent in regard to any non-compliance by the plans uh, with the investment regulations. Um, that had not been done for a while, and so we have intensified that. And and we're looking at the expense ratios as well of of um, the, what what people charge when they do these investment management to try to, to do that. But as the minister mentioned, the big push will be with the new regulations, and uh, hopefully that'll be coming out sometime soon. Um, I've just got a couple of questions, Wendy, from Cameron News Service. Forgive me, because I was late, and I may have missed the mortgage situation. Caymanians been able to take out from their pensions for deposits for a house. Is that being retained in the law? That, sec is. that section of the law has not been uh, dealt, dealt with during this in this public consultation draft that, that that's, so that's for, still for public. Uh, that's still something that people can do as as it stands right now yes we haven't we haven't looked to make an amendment to that particular provision in this current consultation draft the next question regards uh, is regarding the change the transition period from 60 to 65 so for example there are currently people who have passed 60 but have continued to work and but they they're no longer getting money paid into a pension so they may still have their job, but their pension payments have stopped. Will those pension payments, once this law is passed, re restart? Um, I, no, I mean, I think there is there is a kind of a uh, sunset or transition period that is built into the into the law. Um, I can ask one of the technical people to maybe provide a bit more color into that, but uh, the, the intention wouldn't be to kind of restart the, the regime from scratch. The way, <clears throat> excuse me, the way the amendment is worded at the moment, cabinet will make the decision regarding when the actual um, amendment comes into effect, changing it from 60 to 65, and at that time, the specific time frame would be determined. Uh, so they'll de they'll decide w about that that sort of problem of transition, right? The implementation the of it, yes, that will be determined at that in time. In between, what Correct. will happen to them? Okay. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Thanks. I think that's it. I might have another one. I think I had another one, but I've forgotten it. <laughs> so I'll let Tammy go. Uh, Mr. Ebanks, is tomorrow your last day as the Director of Labor and Pensions, or are you staying on? Can you let us know what's going on with that, please? Tomorrow is my last um, full day, long day, and um, then I go into shorter days, in, in theory, <laughs> for for a month, and then um, then hopefully we'll, we'll see what, what goes be, what happened beyond that. With the um, as, as the Acting Chief Officer mentioned last week at the Labor Relations Briefing, I, I've stayed on for another month part-time, and then... Um, assist as best as I can with the public consultation on some critical projects. And um, so I hope that's a, enough of an answer for you, Brent. Yeah, thank you. Are there any other questions? No? Okay. Right. That would conclude the press conference. Thank you again for coming, and thank you to the public for listening. Have a good afternoon. Thank you.